So uh, when we try to quantify the success, there are several ways of doing it, but the one I'm just going to mention is the obvious one is survival. Here with two different types of, of um, tumor models, both syngenaic because we want intact immune systems, uh, B16F10 versus a graft of a um, uh, MMTV polyoma middle T from one donor animal to a recipient animal. You get some aggressive tumors that if without if not treated by surgery, all the animals will be dead in two or three weeks after implantation. With surgery, by conventional means, you can save a few of the animals. But these are pretty aggressive. Doing your best you can uh, in the preliminary stages, just as if you weren't doing any fluorescence, you can, in this case, we save 20% out of 12 or something, or of 10 or 20 animals, and here an even smaller percentage. But if you then go on to use the fluorescence to clean up the system and get residual tumor, we think we can raise the survival rates in some cases quite significantly. And these remain all the way out to long past any possible recurrence of the animals before they were finally sacrificed. So that could have been the, our sort of crude model of, of an actual cure in about half the animals. And that was only half the animals, we think, partly because of the crudeness of the equipment at the time. All of that was done with really lousy imaging, which is shown here. At the time, we only, on the dissecting scope, we only had two views. You could either look at this, which is the ref standard reflected, white light reflected light. How many of you can see exactly where the tumor is? A little tough, okay? We switch to the fluorescence. Now it's a little more obvious. This is the deep red fluorescence of Psi 5 displayed in monochrome on the monitor. You can pretty well see where the tumor is. It's a little hard to do surgery in this form because you can barely see your instruments. They're not fluorescent. You only see them when they're in silhouette against something fluorescent. And Dr. Nguyen got those survivals trying to do surgery, alternating between these two views by hand, pushing filters back and forth, and seeing from this, trying to remember where to cut when she went back to the other view. And then we realized, come on, this is sort of silly, and we really want to overlay them in the computer. So we just took the white light image and false colored it green and laid it on top. And we picked green only because nothing normally inside you and me is green. So it's obviously contrast, right? And I just want to be clear on this because I've had an amazing number of people think that this is GFP. <laughs> okay? They, and especially journalists, they think Dr. Chen got a Nobel Prize in GFP and they've been asleep through the rhythm. There were 30, 40 minutes between then and here. <gasps> that must be GFV. <laughs> but no, it's completely false color for the deep red fluorescence of Psi 5. And then when you do this at 15 frames a second in alternation, you can get a live image that I mean, looks pretty live. And I, here we're cycling. The surgeon has the option of which views. You can get the standard or the uh, fluorescence or the overlay here, and in this case, it becomes much easier to do surgery when you can directly see the tumor as if it was a nasty glowing green. In this case, there's a sciatic nerve here, and that's what you will, don't want to cut, and you'll see how we're making progress on that. But in the meantime, it's hard to see where the tumor is with respect to the nerve until you turn on the fluorescence, and now you can see that there is some green stuff here, and you want to cut the green stuff away from the nerve and clean it up and you wouldn't have been able to tell what you were doing without the benefit of this uh, uh, fluorescence overlay on top of the, uh, the white light reflectance. The surgeon's got to be able to see the instruments in a normal way. Here's a nerve again. Can you see where the tumor is? Not easy until we go to the fluorescence view. There you can see there is some tumor sticking onto it. And now in the combination, the job is relatively simple. You want to scrape the green stuff, like getting the mold off a of cheese. OK, so uh, with respect to surgery, nearly all patients with solid tumors start out with surgery. So we think, why not improve that? And I mention this because when you go to any cancer biology meeting, you have all these people who want to do translation. And they are all looking for some special biochemistry, or signal transduction, or tyrosine kinase, or uh, apoptosis pathway that is unique to cancer cells. And they always figure they're going to treat by chemo, chemotherapy. And so there's enormous competition. And up to now, practically everyone, not quite everyone in the world, but almost everyone has forgotten surgery and radiation therapy, which are practically the other major legs of cancer therapy. And actually, surgery is still, if you can operate on it, that cures you. And it is the best, those are the best cancers to have, are the ones that you can, the surgeon takes care of. You don't have to take all these drugs. 
uh, if you, and that, that resection gives you an immediate cure at relatively low cost compared to a lifetime of medication. And I mention this because, of course, you and I have all, I think, have, at least I have been subjected to endless talks touting the miracle drugs that are going to make cancer a lifetime of cr chronic ailment that you'll take drugs for the rest of your life at typically a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year in medication costs. And meanwhile, the tumors are desperately trying to acquire resistance and they often manage to do so, and we can only hope that then some new drug is then invented to uh, overcome the, say, tyrosine kinase resistance. And I point out that if you take out the tumor and drop it in formaldehyde, I don't care however many other stem cell-like apoptosis-resisting characteristics it has. It is toast <laughs> when it is dropped in formaldehyde and out of you. Obviously, we hope that MRI will help us detect it earlier while the cancer is circumscribed enough to be operable, and for those cases where we cannot clean it up uh, just by surgery, we can always hope for uh, chemo as a follow-up. And my last thing on improving surgery is that something I learned from Dr. Nguyen is that every day in her, you know, when she's doing clinical practice, her worry is cutting nerves. Everything else is relatively tolerable. You can cut muscle. Sorry, Julio, but it grows back. <laughs> you can cut blood vessels, they bleed, you cauterize them. But nerves grow back very, very slowly, and if you cut them, you often give long-term paralysis or loss of sensation and so on. And you know, I have done a bunch of, I think, moderately difficult problems in neurobiology over my you know, years of dabbling in that stuff. And nobody had ever told me that actually something very practical would be, how do you see peripheral nerve? Something as dumb as labeling nerve. Uh, well, so we, instead of doing complicated proteolytic mechanism biochemistry, we decided just let's do phage display. This is a case where I don't need amplification. Nerves are full of concentrated biochemical targets. I don't have to know what they are. Let's just find something that specifically binds to nerve. So we did phage display, found peptides, attached fluorophores, and the result I hope will be shown here. So here again is the white light view. There's the tumor. Now the combined, that's what you're used to seeing. But we have also injected this animal with the fluorescent phage display derived peptide. Okay, again, that's the tumor. Dr. Nguyen is about to start cutting uh, when we go back to the overlay. Let me just stop for a moment. You'll notice actually she's doing it a lot better now. She's uh, uh, cutting much more confidently. And any of you who are looking at the previous operation may have been noticing that she was sort of not really cutting very accurately and close to the green. Well, that was our fault, that at the time we were using lousy software, which introduced 400 milliseconds delay between the camera and the display on the monitor, which does hell to your hand-eye coordination. This is not a reflection on her. At this stage, we've gotten it down to about 150 milliseconds, which doesn't bother people as nearly as badly, so she can cut much better. And that's just you know, fixing the, 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 uh, the software we were using. So about here, the sciatic is beginning to be exposed. And I think most of you can see that there's a branch of the sciatic here, another branch here. And that's what you think you have to avoid. But what you can't see is that when you put on the phage, the phage display peptide and look at its fluorescence, there's a whole extra branch that is diving into the tumor here that is now made visible. And that you would not have wanted to cut. And that was not visible by white light imaging. Now, this peptide is not perfect. It does have some background staining of cut areas. When you cut muscle, something gets revealed that it binds to, and we don't know what it is. But nevertheless, for someone who already is used to hunting out nerves, and I gather a lot of their training, all these years that they practice, is so that they can learn where all this anatomy is. And now it's getting a little easier when you can actually directly see. So what does the peptide recognize in the We don't know. And if you ask, what is the molecular target? This is a blind phage. We're trying to find out what it is, but it's not obvious. It's not so high in affinity yet. It's sort of, uh, we're guessing, micromolar affinity. I'm not sure we're going to be able to pull it out as an affinity column, and I'm quite afraid that the referees will refuse to accept the paper as typical until we get the molecular target. But it does bind. It's not directly to the plasma membrane at axon. We can see a little by microscopy that it's probably staining the sort of uh, interstitial cells in the axon. And we didn't target it that way. I thought myelin would be what I wanted to go for. And it, it's probably not exactly myelin because it doesn't quite have the distribution anatomically of myelin. So 
Uh, and by the way, this is light blue simply because we wanted another color that you don't have in you to contrast with the green of the tumor. So this is a simple code. Cut out the green stuff, leave the blue stuff. Okay. So moving on to the chemotherapy, can we try to do chemotherapy? And here, nanoparticle, we switched now to being, instead of a dendromer, a much larger particle, which is a pegylated liposome, mainly because this is already in the clinic. It's called doxyl, and it's been loaded with doxorubicin. This is a, uh, already in patients, uh, and it is currently used without any active targeting. It's just a liposome with, decorated with peg to make it not so, less sticky. And this stuff leaks through the vasculature of disorganized tumor that, that, that's disorganized in tumors and has a moderate degree of small selectivity, a uh, slight degree of selectivity for tumors, better than doxorubicin by that virtue. Um, but it's just coated lipids with PEG, and so we synthesized, uh, we bought from Avanti this derivative already ready made, which has the, uh, you know, the the bilayer chains, and then a long peg with 45 units of polyethylene glycol and malamide, and then we attach our activatable cell penetrating peptide via a cysteine, which we already have as our you know, chemistry attached to here. So that then we have come out with a liposome that has, and we only put a few copies of this stuff in. It turns out you don't want to put too many, and just on the order of five to 10 copies per entire liposome. There's, probably 50, several tens of thousands of lipid molecules, and just a few of them have been turned into, uh, a had a peptide attached to it. A hope is that the MMP will, of course, cut the green linker, leave the polyarginines behind to make this stuff stick. The dose that we had learned would not cure the tumor completely, and by the second time you put this, uh, you deliver the second dose of liposomes, the, the tumor sort of cruises right past you. Whereas if it is now got our activatable cell penetrating peptides, and actually nine in this, nine copies were better than 27 in this particular case. You could easily put too many on, have it too proteolysis prone, and get it trapped prematurely at sites of low enzymatic activity. That's an excuse. I don't know, really know, but it turned out that uh, the optimum level is somewhere around here. And we do the same amount of doxorubicin seems to be more, can become more effective at treating this tumor. And uh, to go to the other model, this is the polyoma middle T uh, model in which uh, the mice were injected IV with 500,000 cells, and they go into the lung and quite efficiently seed it. Uh, then you uh, treat at four weeks and uh, five weeks later, so we give it plenty of time. Uh, the, the tumor gets quite a head start. Then we put in the doxorubicin liposomes at three mg per kg, harvest them uh, another few uh, weeks later. And uh, if you have sucrose vehicle, you, all these heavy, dense stains are the metastases with the particular histological stain. Uh, liposomes that are, have dox but no targeting will produce some benefit. And when you target it, you get some further benefit. And quantified, that's here. This is the percent of lung covered by metastasis with uh, sucrose or no treatment. You get a lot, some improving with docs and somewhat better with this small level of our peptide on its surface. And uh, if you, instead of plotting uh, just total gross area of lung metastases, you do a size distribution histogram, uh, you get uh, the the blue is sucrose, and it has this big peak for very large metastases. And the each more effective treatment going from uh, doxorubicin and the liposomes with no targeting to the targeted ones with our activatable cell penetrating peptide shifts the, the distribution generally uh, to, towards the left or towards smaller mets. So these are some very early signs, very preliminary, that you can also begin to target a chemotherapeutic this way.